you're going to see from these lectures that mathematics is about numbers, yes, but it's also about logic, it's also about bits and strings of bits and computation and these things are very much related to phenomes, the sounds that we make with our voice and the words that we use in our language, the alphabet, literature. Mathematics actually underlies literature. It's not literature. The literature rides on top of the mathematical structure that's built into our nature and carries it further into imagination, emotions, feelings, all of these things then flow out of that. But it's all riding on uh, language. And language is fundamentally mathematical. Okay. Um, how are you doing, Joe? Good. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this because we're limited on time. Okay. I'm going to actually introduce this by using a Hindu a Hindu myth. It's the myth of Brahma, who's a Hindu mythological figure, and the creation of the world. There are lots of myths about the creation of the world. And what exists before in the story of Brahma and the creation of the world is nothing. In mathematics, we use a pair of braces. These guys when we want to talk about a container, like a basket or a can of stuff. So these braces are a container. Well, what's in the container? Not a lot. What is it? Not a lot. Yeah, exactly how much? Nothing. Nothing, exactly. Nothing, nothing. So this is where Brahma enters the picture. So Brahma enters the picture in the mythological story, and so now there is something. And we're going to use the symbol zero for that. It doesn't mean zero like the number zero. It can in some cases. But I'm using it much more as the ground of being, the most fundamental thing there is. And in fact, in quantum mechanics, that's often the way. The zero is often the ground state of an atom or some kind of quantum system. So the zero is like fundamental reality. And so Brahma in the, in the myth is in this state of meditation, and I might even kind of make a kind of symbol for Brahma here. He's, he, it's, 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 it's not a person, it's not a human being. But you might think of him in this dissolved in the kind of mountain pose of yoga. There he is. Nothing can happen. No change is possible because this is all there is. So even though there is something, there's nothing else. So there can't be any change. So this is just for eternal, unchanging, one state of being, one way to be, motionless, absolutely unchanging. And out of this meditative trance, the story has to move, it's got to go someplace. So Brahma, in this deep meditation, suddenly springs something else into being. I just want to say that before that happens, even if you multiply the Brahma all over the place in that zero state, you don't get any change. You don't get any possibility for change because everything is exactly the same. It's like being in an infinite ocean up, down, right, left, back, forward, of this ether type stuff, which you can't make any distinctions, you can't find your way through it, you're completely in this state. So, zeros everywhere. So then, bang, the one comes into being. And this is when the universe gets rolling. Now suddenly it's possible to change. So, I could image that by saying, Maybe Brahma suddenly got the upward salute. But he still kept the mountain pose. So now you can do upward salute and mountain pose. Now it might seem like that's not very much. And if that's all you had, 
was one Brahma doing one mountain pose and one upward salute. But if you multiply it out and you have lots of them, remember having lots of zeros wasn't helpful. Still no way to make any distinctions. But if there are two ways to be, the, the ground state, which we're calling zero, and this new way of being, which we're calling one, change enters the world. And we go from this, which is just this indistinguishable z bunch of zeros, to this. Now you say, well, this looks pretty crazy. I mean, it's just a bunch of zeros and ones. But if you look carefully, you'll see, well, like right here, here's four ones in a row. And look at, here's one, two, three, four, five, six zeros in a row. So there's some structure here, but it's very hard to know what it is. So we can go to this or we can go to this once we have two things. Once we have, in this case, the zero is a little white space and the one is a black space. If you put a bunch of white spaces and black spaces together, you can make that or this. Two ways to be. The bit enters the world. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the first two lectures talking about the bit. Uh, it's a really important concept. And it didn't even exist 50, well, 70 years ago. Much of what I t I'm going to tell you about has only come to be in the last 50 to 70 years. It's very new, and you'll see that it doesn't perhaps match very well with the traditional mathematics courses that are uh, around these days. So, the bit. It's at the foundation of language and literature. It's the foundation of logic, computation, and number. It's deeply in science and physics, chemistry, and biology. It is the fundamental unit of information. It's the thing that tells you, is it this or is it that? Is it the white square or is it the black square? So bits are everywhere. The most, if you want to think of a bit, or want to have a bit, the most interesting thing is to think of the light switch on the wall, or the simplest thing. It's on or it's off. So here's this bit. It's a switch. Here it's off. It's in the zero state. Here it's on. It's in the one state. That's a bit. Here's something a little more interesting. How many of you have heard of Paul Revere? Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere, one if by land and two if by sea. It's a L William Wadsworth Longfellow poem. And what that was about was Paul Revere was stationed in Boston at the time that the British were going to try to attack the colonists who were at, in Lexington and Concord. And they didn't know if the British were going to sail up the Charles River to get to Lexington and Concord, or whether they're going to march overland. So Paul Revere was waiting, mounted on a horse. A watchman was watching the British, and when he saw how they were going to move, in this case they, they were getting their ships going, he hung two lanterns in an old North Church. If you go to Boston, you can see the old North Church, and there's a statue of Paul Revere in front of it, mounted on his horse. So, lanterns. The zero, the bit in the zero position is one lantern. The bit in the one position is two lanterns. Brains, the nerves in brains, are composed of bits. Oh, let me just back up here. This, um, this is a, uh, a section through the brain, all of these little fibers uh, how do I turn you off? There we go. All of these little fibers are nerves and this is a nerve body. So this is a neuron and what it consists of are fibers, the central processing unit here 
and then a fiber called an axon which sends out a pulse to the other nerves and dendrites which are receiving pulses from other nerves. So all these nerves are connected by these axons and dendrites. And what happens is the nerves are communicating with each other. So when one nerve gets a voltage that rises up to a certain level, it fires. And when it fires, it sends out a pulse and all the other nerves that are touching, see it's the pulse goes out the exon, it touches the other nerve dendrites and excites the other nerves and then it does the same thing. So they're all talking together. They're all interacting together. But at the root of it is just one bit. And that happens when it fires, when it's in the resting state, the bit is off. And when it fires and releases all of these uh, chemicals with the electrical pulse, it's in the on state. You don't have to know the details of how it does that, but nerves are like electrical switches, complicated electrical switches, and they all go back to the bit. Here's Elizabeth with two open strings, the G and D on her violin. She's sitting in the back row. <laughs> if you have two strings on the violin, I'll probably be out of tune if I do this, but Sol, re, sol, re, sol, re. And so you can play those two notes back and forth. And of course, the violin can play a whole lot more bits than just one bit. But if you have two open strings, you have a bit. Okay, now we're not gonna talk about violin strings. Well, let me just say this, any questions? Okay, we're gonna talk now about strings, not violin strings, well, could be violin strings, but more fundamentally, if we have a lot of bits, they make a string of bits. So a universe of many bits is, makes strings. So what can you do with two bits? Well, with one bit, when it's on, we get one string, and when it's off, we get the other string, a zero and one. But look what happens when you have two bits. This is really important. With two bits, we get four strings, not two strings. We get four. So the bits increased from one bit to two bits, but the strings increased from two strings to four strings. And here they are, you can see them. If we have both switches off, that's the zero, zero. If we have the left switch off and the right switch on, that's the zero, one. And then if it's the other way, that this guy's on and this guy's off, that's the one, zero. And if they're both on, that's the one, one. There aren't any more possibilities. That's it. So we get four from two. How many do you think we'd get if we add one more switch and we have three switches? How many different strings could we create? How many different ways of putting those switches on and off? How many different patterns do you think you could make? Let's look at it. So it turns out there are eight patterns. All the three switches could be off, that's zero, 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 and all three switches could be on, that's the one, 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 and then all the other little combinations in between fill in all the other gaps. So with three switches, we get eight strings. Um, this is one of the amazing things about bits. So, I call this Brahma's exponential explosion. Because with one bit, we got two strings, two bits got four, three bits we got eight. If we have n bits, we get two to the n strings. Two to the n different ways to be. Two to the n different possibilities. 
and it's an explosion because it's exponential. We're going to learn more about exponential explosions, so don't worry that you didn't get it all on the first time through. But there's something that happens with bits that creates much, much more from very little. Uh, let me just pause here and ask how many people know what this means? Uh, and how many people would like to know a little bit more? And don't be afraid to say you'd like to know a little bit more. Okay. This is an expon ex exponential. What the exponential in is about that exponent. The, the little number on the top is called an exponent. And the number on the bottom, very often we don't even talk about it, but it's called the base. And what this is, is just an instruction that says something like, two times two, there's a number and an instruction of what you're supposed to do with it. The instruction says, multiply the two times the first guy by the second guy. That's what the instruction says. Exponents also have an instruction. The thing that's sitting in the exponent is an instruction for what to do with the base that it's sitting on top of. This is just convention. This is like a rule that we make up in the same way that, you know, the verb in a sentence is going to point to a direct object sometimes. It's, it's just convention. We could have, in fact, in, in computer code, it's, you don't write it that way. You use uh, If we were writing computer code, it would look like that. But what the instruction says is multiply whatever is sitting in the base position by itself. Multiply what is ever sitting beneath the exponent. That's a 2. Multiply it by itself that number of times. So if it was 2 to the sixth, that's two times two times two times two times two times two. One more? One, two, three. No, no, okay. That's two to the sixth. So that's what that means. Is that, is that helpful? Oh, no, I thought, I thought it was something different. I didn't realize you wrote an in. I thought you wrote something else. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, and when, uh, how many people have had algebra one, elementary algebra, or, or something close to it? Okay, that's good. Okay, so if you haven't had algebra yet, don't worry about it. Just take this as if you ever see this guy again, something that's written like this. It means take the guy that's on the bottom, multiply him by himself the number of times by what's on top. So this will come by again, and uh, that's what exponentials are all about. Okay, so with n bits, we get two to the n strings. That's called an exponential explosion because it really grows fast. It really grows fast. Here's a little graph. Over here, we have n, and it goes up as high as 14. And over here, I've shown n squared. What n squared is, by the, by the same rule, take the n, multiply itself by itself two times. So n times n. That's what that is. I'm going to end up writing on your wall. I'll try to be careful. And here is 2 to the n. So you can see that it makes a big difference when you're comparing it for changing the n value, whether the n is sitting in the bottom or whether it's sitting in the top. So the 2 to the n grows very fast, but n to the 2 is very slow growing. It still grows faster than n to the 1. So this is what we mean by an exponential explosion. And you've heard people use it in common talk, right? Do you ever hear people say, 
oh, that's growing exponentially, or the national debt is growing exponentially, or, and this is true, the world population is growing exponentially. That's a very true statement, and it's a serious problem. Okay. So Brahma's explosion in bits makes strings, and the strings can describe all possible things in the universe. That's because these strings are very powerful. They are exponentially powerful. It doesn't mean that we know what they are, or that we could enumerate them or describe them. But conceptually it says nature is formulated in terms of particles, elementary particles, atoms, molecules. If we go deeper, we have quarks and leptons and other elementary particles. But there's this particulate nature of matter. And when you put these particles together, you put bits together. And when you put them together, they blow up exponentially. And it's perfectly reasonable when you think about how rich and complicated our world is. Just how rich and complicated a biological cell is. And certainly how rich and complicated you are. So I thought you might like to know about the bits in the present universe. The entire universe that we know of is about 10 to the 90. Now what does that mean? That means 10 multiplied by itself 90 times. Or, is a nice way to think about these exponent, when we have very large numbers, we don't want to write all the zeros. It's way too hard to do. So what we do is we write it this way. And what this really says, for example, if you can see this one, here's a, here's a human being, 10 to the 28. What it means is burn this into your memory right today and see if you can hang on to it. Whenever you see 10 to the blah, 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 it means there are blah, blah, blah zeros after the one. So 10 to the 28 is a one with 28 zeros following it. 10 to the ninth, nine zeros. That's a billion, actually. Uh, 10 to the ninth is a billion, billion, billion. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's three times three times three. It's a million, million, million. But when we get, so all the planets are, consist of 10 to the 75 bits. So these are huge numbers, very large numbers, and indeed they should be. Planet Earth by itself is 10 to the 50. Human being, 10 to the 28. One of the bacterial cells in your body, 10 to the 14th. Human DNA, that's the DNA in our, in our bodies, 10 to the 9th. A little hemoglobin molecule has still got quite a large number of atoms. It's a pretty big molecule, but it's very simple compared to all the others. 10 to the 4 bits. And one atom in the ground state, one bit. So that's the range of bits. Now we come to something really important. And uh, unfortunately, Sherry Sheeler isn't here. Right? Is there anybody here who is a mom? No moms. OK. <laughs> um, so. Um, what? Fine, we have all of these strings of bits, but what does it mean? What's the meaning of these things? And this is where another concept is going to come in. We had a bit, we had a bit string, we're now going to have code. Is yes? Is this essentially binary? Bit. Is binary it? digital. That's where it comes from. Yes. B-I, by, binary. So everything, uh, the bit is binary. If it's not a bit, yes. if it's not a bit, it would be called a trit or, or an in, in it. <laughs> dits, there's another word, dits sometimes. But bits, really c quite good. And that word was only coined about 70 years ago. And it's binary, means binary, binary digit, binary digit. 
And it also is nice because it is a bit. It's a little thing. It's a tiny little thing that everything else is made of. Well, that's that's the ten, ten to the ten to the three is is a kilobit, right? Ten to the six would be a megabit. Not a byte, but a megabit. I'll I'll explain what bytes are later. But bytes are bytes are basically eight bit strings. So a byte's eight bits long. Yeah, two hundred fifty six combinations because of one and zero. Right, exactly. So, the code, what is code? Code is the assignment of meaning to a string. If the string's going to mean something, it's going to have to have a code. So, let's see about some code. The code of Paul Revere's bit is one lantern means by land. That's what that string, that string, this is a one bit string. That string means by land. This one, which is the two lantern string, it's not two bits, it's two lanterns, means by C. So that's the code for Paul Revere's bit. It didn't have to be that because it's humanly made. You could have flipped it around and said, well, I think I'm going to call one the by land and the zero by C. You could do that, but you better tell Paul about it if you changed it. So humanly made codes are created by human beings in the same way we create literature, we create uh, poems, novels, and so on. Okay, now I want to do an illustration where I was really hoping a mom would be here. So the first question is, how many strings do we have for two bits? We're going we're to have two bits. Do you remember what that was? Four, Four strings, okay. So this is going to be a really simple illustration. We're going to illustrate code. So the two bits give us four strings. And so here are our four strings. And we can assign a meaning to them. And this is arbitrary. I'm going to assi I assign these meanings. I wisely, I'm, what I'm going to do is try to write an English sentence. So I wisely am picking a couple of vowels. But I also need space, because we put space between words in English. So I'm going to use the zero, zero guy to mean space. Wherever you see a zero, zero string, that means space. The zero, one, I'm going to have become an I. The one, zero, I'll let it be an M. And the one, one is going to be an A. I have space and three letters. That's all that's in this universe, space and three letters. And I want to see if I can write something interesting. So I wrote you a message. We can encode four English characters. This is, the, this is it. And here I'm writing you a 40-bit text. OK, that's what I'm writing you. Incidentally, all of this is going to be online, so you can uh, review it once it gets up. It'll be, might take a few days before it gets up. So, right away, if you start reading from the left, there's a zero one. Does that tell you anything? No. Look at the dictionary. This, this is the dictionary for the code. I didn't say that, but it, it's the dictionary. So if you want to know what a string means, go to the dictionary and find what letter it corresponds to, or it might correspond to a space. So how about zero, 01? I. I, right. So here's a zero, 01. We go to the dictionary. We look for zero, 01. There it is. We read across in the dictionary, and there's the I. Let's do the next two. Zero, 00. Zero, zero. Go to the dictionary, find the zero, zero. There it is. What is it? Space. Now, before we go any further, what I'm going to do is put all the spaces in. So I'm going to go and I'm going to, what I, what I did to help us out here, speed things up a little bit, is wherever there's a zero, zero, I'm, I put the space in. So. The zero zeros are gone, and instead I put a space. That makes it a little easier for us to read. 
Okay, let's try to get... Uh, I was going to have a, a, a mom read this, but you'll, you'll see why. We'll read it all together. We'll pretend we're all moms. 1110. Now that's going to be two letters because each pair of, of uh, digits, each string, is a letter. So what's the 1-1? One, one? One one. Go to the dictionary. A. So that one one is an A. Uh, how many people would like a little help on getting clear on that? Okay. I think what I'm going to do is, uh, well. So. One, 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 zero. So these are all two-bit strings. One, one. We go to the dictionary. That's A. Hold the A in your mind right now. That's an A. I won't write on your board here. <laughs> so we have an A there. Now we have a, a one, zero. One, zero in the dictionary is an M. So we have A, M. Is that a word? Yeah. I am. Pretty fundamental statement. In my uh, childhood education in theology, that was the word God said. I am. I am just pure being. So that's A and that's M. Now here's a 1-1 one, one again. So that's going to be the A again. So I am A. Now we have a one zero. We haven't had that before. What's the one zero? One zero. Go to the dictionary. Look in the dictionary. Find the one zero. There it is, right? Read across to what it codes for. It codes an M. Codes an M. So this, this is an M. Is that, is that looking possible? Looking okay? All right. And now, here's our 1-1 one, one again. We've had that before. What is the 1-1? One, one? The 1-1. One, one. Right. Remember, look at the digits. These are all two-bit strings. Look at the digits. Go to the dictionary. Look it up and find a letter. So that is an A. And this was an M. I am a ma. So I think you see why I wanted to find a mom to help me do this. And now this is a tribute to Dr. Seuss. Zero one. What's the zero one? I. We had M. I am. I am a ma, I am, I am. That's a good Dr. Seuss statement. Okay, you're gonna, this is gonna be up on the internet as a video, and actually I'll try to have all the slides available as a PDF, so you can look at the slides independently. So you can go back and, and take a look at this. So you see how you can make messages with bits. But, here's a message from 378 one-bit Brahmas. But it's, not co it's, it's going to be using more than just three letters. In fact, it's going to be using the whole alphabet. So this, this, this string of zeros and ones in what's called ASCII encoding it's an American standard from computer information interchange. It's what your computers use. It's what all computation uses as the way of storing text and beyond text. And these are in 8-bit strings. So how many, how, many, how many different characters can we have? 256. 256 characters. Well, we only need 26 for the alphabet, but 
you might like to use capitals. So then you need 52, and you might need the numerals, 1 through 9, 0 through 9, and you might like to have our good old uh, braces, parentheses, brackets, punctuation. punctuation, blah, blah, blah. And that still leaves quite a bit of room. So what that string says is welcome to the beauty and wonder of mathematics. Now, this is very important, and I, I hope we have time to, to do it. Yes, we're doing pretty well. We've still got, still got 20 minutes. Before human beings, nature was and is creating codes, creating meaning in the bits that are encoded in atoms and molecules. Now, nature's code is written in the chemical bonds so of the atoms and molecules of the universe. So w when an atom is, say, for example, just free, hydrogen atom floating freely, and another uh, couple of oxygen atoms floating freely, they have a certain structure in their electron cloud. But if they bind together in water so that the hydrogen, two hydrogens bond together with an oxygen and make H2O, those bonds are changed. The bits have flipped. They're no longer the same bits. There's something different. And it's registered in the very structure of the molecule. There it stares you in the face and says, I'm water. Those guys before were just hydrogen gas and oxygen gas bopping around. Well, where did this code come from? Well, it evolved over 3.7 billion years by the process of natural selection. That's how, it, that's how it came to be. It took a long time, especially the code for anything in life, involving life. But before life, just the evolution of um, condensation of gases into planets, the eruption of uh, volcanoes and the condensation and uh, evolution of inorganic matter, minerals, rocks. They also have atoms which bind together and an, an atom that's bound together in say calcium carbonate, calcium and carbon and carbonate is going to be very different from say pure carbon and charcoal. The bits are flipped, not the same bits. That's what makes the difference. Uh, okay, hold your breath. One last thing we're going to do here. I want to try to show you, and we're going to we'll go over this again next time. So don't don't worry if it doesn't all you can't quite get it all. Nature codes life from six principal atoms: carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. You don't have to know exactly what they are, but it turns out there are only six major atoms, and then another dozen of minor ones. But this is 90, over 90 percent of all of the things that's in life and in our bodies is only those six elements, those six atoms. Somehow there's a code that takes a bunch of these and makes a human being. Now I'm going to the extreme here. It might have been better to just say, let's do one cell. Even that's enormously complicated. But let's do the whole human being. So what I'm trying to show you here is how a typical molecule that's in the human body, this is a fairly complicated molecule and you don't have to know exactly all of its twists and turns. It's hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is in a blood cell. It's the thing that transports oxygen in the blood, this little molecule. And it's sitting inside the red blood cell. And this is what it looks like in a kind of biochemistry cartoon. And this is sort of what this heme molecule looks like. What I want you to take away from this is see this bonding structure? These are carbons. 
this is, this is a, a carbon-hydrogen complex. Here's some oxygen and carbon. And these are double bonds. Nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen. This is a text. Nature wrote this text. Nature's writing it to you. Nature's saying, I'm the heme molecule. And it took me three, well, heme probably got here in a little less than 3.7 billion because it's been around for a while. But not much. That's how I got here. And what makes me what I am is the way the chemicals, the way the atoms are bonded together. And if you change that bonding structure, it's like going into a book and changing the text. Change it around. Go into your word processor. Change the text. It's not the same message anymore. Go into a molecule, react it with some other chemicals, it's no longer the same text. So we have 10 to the 28 bits of human beings that are stored in atoms. That's 7 billion 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 atoms. And that, if, if you could put them all in a box, we, on the one hand we have a box of atoms, and on the other hand we have a human being. Well, first of all, you can't really put them in the box because they try to start interacting and reacting with one another. They'd start raising the pressure, condensing out. It would be just a wild spectacle. But conceptually, there's a code that goes from these guys to a human being. So the first thing is you've got to go from the atoms to molecules. This is a typical simple molecule hydrogen cyanide. You don't have to remember it exactly, just remember the first thing that happens is you go from atoms to pretty simple molecules. It's got a triple bond here, but there are only three atoms in this molecule. That's the thing to take away. Go from atoms to a simple molecule. Now to take the next step, we've got to go from simple molecules to complex molecules. And this hydrogen cyan, this HCN atom that I, or molecule that I'm showing you, is hydrogen cyanide. And you've probably heard of cyanide and you think it's poison, but that's mostly cyanide's actually a rather important precursor in doing a lot of the chemistry of life. So from the hydrogen cyanide interacting with carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen, you start forming all kinds of slightly more complicated uh, molecules. These, these molecules are more complicated than cyanide, but they're not as complicated at all as hemoglobin. So from molecules, we go to complex molecules. And from com complex molecules, we go to supermolecules. Supermolecules have thousands and thousands of atoms in them. And they're kind of amazing. They start to be able to do stuff. These happen to be, um, well, here's DNA, for example. The rest of these, and here's a lipid, which is uh, one of the important uh, chemicals in life. Uh, these things are super molecules. They're molecules, but they're really big and complicated, and they can do very complicated jobs. Uh, here's hemoglobin, insulin. Uh, don't worry about that guy. But the next thing, step up, are the super molecules. And then the next step up are cells, tissues, organs, bodies, and behavior. So there is a code that has slowly evolved and moves from all of these very simple things, beginning with the bit, to very complicated things that are contained in the code. We don't know that code. We know little bits and pieces of it. In fact, we know some very important parts of it, 
We know the code for DNA and proteins. Very important code. Proteins are the things that make up all of the body and behavior of living things. So, but there's a lot of this code that is still very poorly understood and probably can't be completely understood. Certainly the code uh, can't be completely understood. What's amazing is how much as human beings we have the capacity to understand. How much we have learned about our world in our short existence on this planet. Very short. We are newcomers. So this is just a summary of what we've done. Um, what I would like you to try to remember, and when you go back and review the video, if, if I hope you might like to do that, the bit, that's what we started with, then we got a string, then we got an exponential explosion in which the whole world comes into being. I think Bra Brahma would have been happy to learn about exponential functions. And then we talked about code, which is where the meaning comes from. And nature puts that meaning into those elementary things. So I'm going to stop now, and I would like to ask you to ask questions. Or ask me to clarify something. Or silence. How many strings from in bits? How many strings from two bits? Four. Four. How many strings from n bits? Two to the n. Two to the whatever the number of strings, the number of bits is. Number of strings is two to whatever the number of bits is. Surely you have some questions. Why does every bit begin with two? Because you saw when Brahma only existed with only one state, there was no way to change. Nothing could change. There was nothing to change to. If Paul Revere only had one lantern, and they had to s describe whether it's going to be by sea or by land, he's stuck. Well, you could say, well, he could just put no lantern up, but then that's the way the North Church is all the time. So how would, how would that communicate? So you've got to have the switch, this switch. This is your great example of a bit, on and off. So if you, if you get befuddled and you say, oh gosh, what is a bit? Think about the light switch to help guide you to get your thinking, ah yes, that's what it is. It's something that can be one way or another. And then think about how you put bits together. Bits together make strings, and the strings have this power of exponential explosion. Yes, yes, you could use growth. I was trying to find a better word. I don't particularly like the word explosion, but it, it's, it's pretty explosive. And I was trying to, if you, if you find a better word for me, let me know. Yes? You, rather than use explosion, like, I didn't know, like, the exponential, like, what you said before, but I was thinking, like, what about growing like a weed, basically, because weeds grow pretty fast. Yes, they can grow exponentially. There's a lot of exponential growth in life. That doesn't mean it's all exponential, but there is a lot of exponential growth in life. Well, I never thought we'd get through this today, especially with the shortened time. Um, give me some feedback. How many people are comfortable with this level of presentation? And I especially want people to also speak up if it's not working and, and you would like it to slow down or, or 
spend more time on certain points. Um, well, let me, I, I do have a little bit of time left, so now I'll, I'll talk about some of the housekeeping. Uh, do, you some do you have any observations, Ezekiel? No, I, or thought, I thought in, I Okay, hands, so okay. I, um, I have a little handout here I'm going to hand out. Just help yourself, take a copy. And uh, I'll, let, I'll let you... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. This is a little handout, basically, just of some things that might be helpful while we're doing these sessions. Uh, the first thing I just wanted to mention is a math assistant. Now, it's come to be an important tool in modern science and mathematics. It's not essential. You could think your thoughts in mathematics the way the Pythagoreans did, and the way most mathematicians did before we had uh, computers, personal computers. But they are really helpful. You saw that plot that I had of 2 to the n versus n. I did that with a math assistant just like that. So the standard of the, the math, there are several math assistants that are extant, but probably the most uh, important and, the, and one of the original ones is Wolfram Mathematica. It's Mathematica. It is expensive and they do have student discounts, which are pretty, which are very substantial. They're hoping that after you get all educated, then you're going to buy the, the full version. But they also have free online Wolfram Alpha and it's mentioned here Alpha is free you can get a better version of Alpha that allows you to do more things if you have an annual subscription which is fifty dollars a year but it's you can do what I did on that plot well actually not quite for um, free and it does a lot more things than just plot. But I'm interested in, sometimes we want to do a calculation. We want to find out how many bits there are in DNA, for example. Or you can ask Alpha that question. I give a couple of questions you could ask it. It tries to be kind of a knowledge engine. But mainly, I'm thinking of it as a very sophisticated calculator. Sometimes we, and a lot of times what we're going to do involves visualization. I feel visualization is really important. We're going to be talking about mathematics as art, and we want to see the art that mathematics makes, and we want to see how that art actually has a very strong scientific message in it. So uh, if you have a laptop or tablet, I think it would be good for you to bring it to these sessions and, and maybe have, it, have a tab or one tab open to Wolfram Alpha so that if we need to do a calculation or want to make a plot, you could easily quickly do it. So bring your laptops if you have one. Uh, you have an internet connection here? Good, okay. Uh, and finally, I want to mention Khan Academy. I would guess you probably already might know about it. Um, I did not discover Khan Academy until the last year. And I have checked it out on several levels. Uh, first of all, on the level of elementary math, and then on the level of slightly more advanced algebra, algebra 2. And one of the things I particularly was interested in is see how it dealt with exponentials and exponential functions and logarithms. And it's, it's pretty good. It's quite good. So I'm not going to teach that stuff. You'll, Somebody worked really hard in making these Khan Academy videos, thought about it, tried to, tested it out. These are really well done. So if you really want to kind of drill in and learn something, you'll do better to watch that video and work on it than to let me repeat the same thing. So I'm not going to do any of that. What I'm trying to do is talk to you about the beauty and the wonder. So, uh, Khan Academy is a very important thing to have at hand to bone up on. And the first thing you can bone up right, right now on 
exponentials and logarithms. And on the back of this page, I think, yes, I have a little ex brief introduction to exponentials and logarithms. You can read that and see if you like that and see if that helps you. Uh, I found that there's enormous confusion, especially about logarithms, uh, even among um, adults, even among adults who've taken math. Logarithms, what was that about? Especially of my generation. Older people are really confused about what logarithms are. Now maybe you're a younger generation, you may be in great shape and not carrying all this baggage that the older people carry. But um, if you want to get a little bit ahead and can check out exponentials and logarithms, do that. Well, you know, I think I've, unless you have another question, uh, I, uh, I think I've said all I want to say today. <laughs>